Hi, Devin. I am going to read to you from What If 2. And here we go. Our first section is, What if the Earth's core suddenly stopped producing heat? And we have a lovely little cartoon. The core of the Earth has stopped producing heat. Whatever, it's fine. Any instantaneous physical change in the Earth could, in theory, change the stress within the crust and cause earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. But if we, as if you assume whatever caused uh, the whatever caused the uh, core to stop producing heat also gently redistributed those short-term stresses, then the actual change in heat flow wouldn't really be a problem. Most of our heat comes from the sun. The flow through the crust is such a small part of the Earth's overall surface heat balance that it wouldn't affect the atmosphere much. <clears throat> if the outer core solidified, we'd lose our magnetic field. But despite what the film, the 2003 film The Core would tell you, that wouldn't cause microwave beams from space to cut the Golden Gate Bridge in half or anything. <clears throat> it would just slightly increase the rate at which our upper atmosphere is lost to space. Over a long enough time, plate tectonics, which are, is powered by the Earth's internal heat, would grind to a halt. Plate tectonics are a key part of the long-term carbon cycle, which regulates the Earth's temperature, so eventually that thermostat would fail, and the oceans would boil away. But that's going to happen anyway, so I wouldn't worry about that. Don't worry, you have plan time to plan for that, like millions and millions of years. <clears throat> okay. We have further questions. Could humanity, with our current dis uh, technology, destroy the moon? Can global warming cause the Earth's magnetic fields to weaken? If you used a laser, would you be able to bake something? Okay. No, no, and yes, respectively. And we have a chart. Can we, and then using. So, can we destroy the moon? Using lasers, all human technology, or global warming? No, no, no. Can we weaken the Earth's magnetic field? Using lasers, using all of our technology, global warming? No. Can we bake cookies using lasers, using all of humanity's technology, and with global warming if it gets really bad? Okay, furthermore, if, what if the earth was sliced in half, like an apple. Where should you be such that you have the best chance of survival? And here we go, here, being the person doing the slicing. What would happen if a person dropped into a pool full of jellyfish? Okay, it depends on the species. The largest group of jellyfish I've ever seen were moon jellies whose sting is often so mild that humans don't, know, don't even notice it. They feel surprisingly firm to the touch, like, war, like wet gummy candies. So it's possible the person would just make some slippery new friends. You're my new best friend. I'm going to call you Jelly Donut. When the sea overtakes your cities, my kind will float through your streets and feed upon your ruins. Ah, oh, so cute. Okay, we have further short answers. Would it be possible to make a house floor into a massive air hockey table so you could move heavy furniture across the room? Yes, and I know what my next home improvement project is going to be. My seven-year-old son asked us over for over. Sorry, my seven-year-old son asked us over dinner recently. At which, at which point potatoes melt? I assume in a vacuum. Please advise. Potatoes don't really melt at any temperature. The starches break down and gelatinize or gelatinize, which is part of the of the normal cooking process. As the heat rises, the different components will sublimate at different temperatures. But what I want to know is, do you normally add in a vacuum to all his questions and assume that's what he meant? Okay, we have a cartoon. Can I have a pizza party for my birthday? You want a pizza party in a vacuum? That will be tough, but we can try. 
Okay. And now we ask, would a pigeon be able to make it to space if it was not affected by gravity? The answer is no. Birds cannot flap around in zero gravity and might be able... Oh, wait. No. Birds can flap around in zero gravity and might be able to propel themselves along, but it's too cold in the upper atmosphere and pigeons need to breathe. So we have a diagram. We have the pigeon flight zone, very low. We have the highest recorded bird flight there. Region where it's really cold and the air is too thin to breathe. And then space. And there's a mountain, of course. Doesn't look good for pigeon flying to outer space. If you were flying blind through the Milky Way, what would be the odds of hitting a star or a planet? <clears throat> even if you threw, if you flew through edge on, so you spend as much pot time as possible in the dense galactic disk, your odds of hitting a star would only be about one in 10 billion. <clears throat> your odds of hitting a planet would be a thousand times smaller. For comparison, that's about the same as the odds of deciding to call Barack Obama, picking up your phone and dialing 10 random digits and getting his cell number on the first try. The flight across the galaxy would take a long time, though. If you try a number, if you try a number every 30 seconds, it would only take you 10,000 years to dial them all. The trip across the galaxy will take longer, 10 million years at 1% the speed of light. So that will give you and Obama plenty of time to chat once you get his number. Hello, Barack Obama. Beep, 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 beep. Darn. Hello. Beep, beep. Hello, Barack Obama. Darn. On various bodies in our solar system, feel free to group any that are equivalent. Roughly how long could you typically survive on the surface? For gas giants, assume you are on a magical platform at some point in the atmosphere that you could reasonably treat as a surface, as the surface, with nothing but an infinite air supply and warm winter clothing. That is, no helmet, no pressure suit, just a nose and mouth air mask attached to a magic air generator and clothing that would be suitable to, for, say, Chicago in winter. No cute tricks like using the magic air supply to generate heat or whatever. <clears throat> Earth. We have 100-ish years. Venus, weeks to months. Everywhere else, minutes to hours. Interesting that he lists Venus as weeks to months. Ah, I see why. There is a layer within the atmosphere of Venus where the temperature and pressure are both relatively close to Earth normal surface conditions. The only place in the solar system like that other than the Earth and the interior uh, like that other than the Earth and the interior is a spacecraft. But I imagine the sulfuric acid fog on your skin would get a little old before too long. Hey, Venus isn't so bad. I bet the view would be pretty if I could open my eyes without burning them. What would happen if someone dropped an anvil on you from space? <clears throat> the good news is that, the, that, the, that an anvil is small enough that the atmosphere would slow it down to a terminal velocity by the time it reached you. The bad news is that the terminal velocity of an anvil is roughly 500 miles per hour. When, the an, when an anvil lands on you, it doesn't really matter how high it fell from. Okay, I'm going to give you a definition of terminal velocity. So when you drop something, it speeds up. As it speeds up because of Earth's gravity, it encounters more wind resistance because it's going through the air faster. So at some point, the amount of resistance from the air, which is experienced as wind going up as you fall, that resistance force from the wind equals the force of gravity. When it equals the force of gravity, you continue to fall but at a constant, staying the same speed. Because you are no longer speeding up because of Earth's gravity, because Earth's gravity's force has been balanced by the wind that is rushing past you. For humans, 
it's a lot lower speed than 500 miles per hour. I think it's 120 miles per hour, but I'm not sure. But for an anvil, apparently it's 500 miles per hour. It has to do with how much more dense an anvil is than a human. So it's got a large mass compared to whatever surface it has that it is running into the wind. But we have a diagram, of course. We have height, the anvil falls on you from in meters, and injury severity. So we start off at zero, injury severity is already fairly high, <clears throat> and then once we get up to one or two meters, the injury severity pretty much reaches its maximum and never gets any worse or any better because it just is going to be completely lethal. Okay. We're going to read one more section. What if I want to heat my house using toasters? How many do I need? Not very many, since your house will probably catch fire if you lose, leave toasters running all the time. Once it does, the house will become self-heating for the rest of its lifetime. We have a cartoon. I've discovered a way to make our house self-heating for about 15 or 20 minutes. But for the short time before your house caught fire, toasters would keep it warm just fine. Electrical, electric space heaters aren't always the best way to heat a home. Using electricity to directly produce heat is generally less efficient than using that power to warm up outside air using a heat pump. <clears throat> or in some places, electricity can be more expensive than natural gas or oil heat. But one neat thing about space heaters is that they're all equally efficient. All space heaters produce one watt of heat for every watt of electricity they draw. Okay. And we have a diagram. Okay, this is heat produced per watt. Cheap space heater, one watt. Fancy space heater, one watt. Toaster, one watt. Light bulb, any kind, one lot. Big Mouse, Billy Bass, Novelty, Singing Fish. You should find out what that is if you don't know. One watt. Okay. Seems like there's some shenanigans here. In fact, thanks to the laws of thermodynamics, just about every electric device that consumes power eventually turns that power into heat at the same rate. A 60-watt 60 60 light bulb produces light, but that light hits a surface and heats it up. In the end, it produces about the same 60 watts of heat as a 60 watt space heater. Toasters, blenders, microwaves, and light bulbs all produce heat at the rate of one watt per watt, just like a space heater. An average toaster uses about 1,200 watts of electric power, and the heating system for a typical house in the northern United States might need to supply 80,000 BTUs um, per hour which works out to 25,000 watt hours per hour, or 25,000 watts. <clears throat> Heating one of the ho these houses would take about 20 toasters. If you don't want to run your toasters empty, you could try making, a lot of, making lots of toast, but you'll quickly have more than you can eat. If each toaster can hold two slices and it takes about two minutes to toast each one, then your toaster will go through about 30 loaves of bread per hour. At peak, you'll be consuming bread at the rate of a medium-sized American town. We close with a cartoon. This is the worst idea for heating a house since or with sliced bread. And that's the reading for tonight. Good night, Devin. I love you. Sleep tight and don't let the chappies bite. Mwah. 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 Good night. I love you.